Hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome to today's Reshape Your Menopause show. I'm just going to check that we are streaming into the Facebook group and to into various places. If you can see me, if you can hear me, please just let me know in the chat because we have a super, super awesome guest with us today and you do not want to miss today's talk. Let me see. Are we in the Facebook group? If you can see me, you can hear me, please say hi. Yeah, we are in the Moving and Reshaping Club Facebook group. Let me just turn down the sound. And I'm going to pin this post to the featured section because lots of people, when I advertised the show yesterday, lots of people were saying that they wanted to come to the replay. So I just want to make sure that everyone can see us. And if you're watching us in LinkedIn and YouTube as well, hello, hello, hello. I am Tracy Sider. I am host of the Moving and Reshaping Club Facebook group and creator of the Reshape Method, where I help peri- and postmenopausal women show them a different way, an alignment-based way to get in shape, be egg-free and age audaciously that no one is talking about. So another thing that many people don't really talk about is the boobs, okay? And we have with us today, women's health advocate, Tali Rabin. Let me bring Tali on. Tali, thank you so much for coming Hi. to talk to us today, where we are going to be what sharing the memories, <laughs> sharing the good memories. Tali is going to be speaking to us about um, our breast health, and, and why it can be such an important but often overlooked part of our overall aging and health as peri- and postmenopausal women. So let me hand over to you, Tully. Um, tell us about the boobs. Thank you. Well, I'm so excited to be here. First of all, I love your presence, your energy. It's so great to be with you, Tracy. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so, so yeah, I am Tali Rabin, and as Tracy mentioned, I am a women's health advocate. I really do advocate that women are empowered to live a healthy and uh, preventive lifestyle. And, and so uh, for years, I was a coach and um, coached many different areas of life. And then I discovered um, through my, my sweet husband who brought thermography to Canada, I discovered thermography and how amazing a tool it is and how much it can really help women with regards to uh, being empowered about their health, breast health, yes, but overall, overall health. And we do image more than just breast, but breast is really a um, very important area. And so I've been working in this field now for about seven years uh, doing thermography. And I I love what I do. It's not often you can say that you love what you do. I really yeah. love what So I tell do. us, what is thermography? Okay, Let's so thermography is a non-invasive, radiation-free, thermal medical imaging technology. And so what it's doing is much like everybody's aware of the point and uh, measure um, thermometers that have been used during COVID and, and so on, that technology is is using thermal thermal energy, thermal thermography. So it's capturing the heat coming off the surface of your skin, which tells us how your body's functioning beneath the skin. And why that information is really important is because um, it's different information than anatomical information. So like an X-ray or mammogram or ultrasound, those have their place, but they're anatomical. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but what they don't show you is how your body is functioning on a physiological level. And that's what thermography is providing, how your body's functioning, uh, things like lymphatic flow, vascular activity. It's the best tool to detect any inflammation in the body because it's measuring the heat. We see temperature patterns. Uh, we can see flows of, you know, let's say lymphatic drainage, et cetera. So it's an amazing technology. Um, I'll talk about the breasts. Okay. Cause that's what everybody wants to, that's what we're here for the boobs. Um, a lot of women of course, um, know about mammograms and I'll talk a little bit about thermography in comparison to mammogram, just cause mammogram is what's really known. Um, so mammography is really, it's a good tool to use when someone knows that they already have something growing in their breast. Um, why? Because a mammogram will only detect a lesion after it's been there for at least five, sometimes even eight to 10 years. 
that's what a lot of people don't realize. So, so the person could be going for a mammogram sometimes on an annual basis and being told that there's nothing there, but actually there could be something there. Um, so the question is then, well, why, what, what about that zero to five or eight, 10 year mark? What about that? And, and so that's where thermography comes in because if someone's body is starting to change, if something is starting to grow, it happens on a cellular level at a very minute level first, but a lot of blood is going to go to that area and that produces heat. And that's a physiological change before an anatomical or structural change. In other words, before something like a mass starts to develop. Mm -hmm. So that change that's happening on a cellular level is what you want to get at as early as possible. And that's really preventive because it doesn't mean that someone, God forbid, has cancer already. It could be something else, um, or it could be very, very early, early stages of possible cancer. Um, thermography isn't saying, oh, there is cancer, there isn't cancer, but can give you a visual of how are your breasts functioning? Is there any abnormal activity that could be indicative of something potentially growing? Um, usually these things happen on one side and not on the other. So there's an asymmetric pattern. Um, and so having a snapshot, a visual of how your breasts are functioning in that way gives you the ability to see, okay, what steps should I take to shift uh, into a new direction if necessary? So the thermography gives you a risk assessment. TH1 is the lowest risk. TH5 is the highest risk and then two, three, four in between. So um, someone, you know, typically people are around a, a two, let's say it's kind of common. But someone might be maybe one side is a two and one side is a three, you know, so that might be a little bit more of a medium risk and then moving up. Um, but why is this information important? Because it's, again, very early information that allows you to then make lifestyle changes. So, for example, um, there could be certain patterns that may be indicative of hormonal change. We're talking about perimenopause, menopause. There's lots of hormonal changes going on in the body. And sometimes we don't even know, we don't have symptoms necessarily, but there are hormonal changes starting and that could show up in our breasts. And so we'll say we recommend getting a hormone panel um, for, you know, get yourself checked and see how your hormones are. If there's anything out of balance, um, that's one example. Another lifestyle change could be around food. So, someone could be eating foods that are maybe very inflammatory and not realizing it. And that will show up in the breasts as well. Our breasts are like a mirror, like, a, like I said a, about the topic here, it's a window mm -hmm. into our overall health. Yeah. Um, our stress levels, how we think, how we're, our wellness, our mental wellness, it does affect our physical wellness and that can affect the breasts as well. So I kind of like to look at it as, um, if you guys kind of go from, you know, from your head down, you know, how you think, um, your, your dental, I'll get into that in a moment. Um, your, what you put into your body and also what you wear. So these are sort of the main kind of things to look at when you're talking about how can I just maintain my breast health? Well, if you can kind of focus on those four things and maybe not all at once, maybe start with one and then work another one in, um, but starting with, you know, how is my mental wellness? Am I, am I in a lot of negativity? Am I thinking negative? Am I constantly surrounded by negative? Or do I have a lot of conflicts that are not resolved in my life or resentments from the past that I haven't resolved? I mean, these are pretty big things to talk about. We could have a whole show just on that, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's important. And, and we don't realize how much that can affect our, you know, chemical, physical, uh, and physiological well-being. Right. And is that one of the um, hidden causes of breast disease that you were mentioning in the promo? You know, that's one of them. And and why is like, like, what do you mean? If I think of this, then it's a, it's not like an overnight sensation, but there are, there's a whole studies done on different personality types. And, um, and so certain uh, personality types that are more kind of laid back, if you will, versus um, more, kind of stressed in particular and, you know, holding on to resentments or things like that. Um, 
And these on an ongoing basis for years and years, yeah, this is actually going to affect our physical body. Because and of the inflammation it causes? It can, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, another one, and this is this is one of the major hidden causes that a lot of people don't know about. Maybe some of your listeners who are more educated know about this, but it's dental. Dental pathology is connected to both heart and breast health. The lymphatics, they start here. They come down through the neck and they come and wrap around the breast and then continue down. Lymphatic flow goes both up and down. So if there are issues in the mouth that go through and down to the breast or up as well. So what that means is that if there are issues, someone, for example, could have breast issues, someone who might have had breast cancer. We've had cases of women who have had breast cancer They get it treated, they're fine, and then it comes back. Well, because what they didn't do is check their dental, and that might be causing recurrences. Okay, so Mm -hmm. why, how? Well, it could be um, procedures that are done. It's becoming more and more widely known that root canals are a procedure that are just generally not good. And I'm sorry, you know, if there's a dentist on the the line here watching and people have different opinions, um, but there's a lot of research on the negative impact of root canals. Why? What's happening? A root canal is usually when there's an infection in the tooth and the person wants to keep their tooth. They don't want to pull the tooth. And this comes from the, from the olden days, actually, you know, if you had a tooth pulled, you looked like you were some kind of, you know, in poverty or something. And so people wanted to keep keep their teeth, but it's actually interesting in the history that people who um, had more teeth pulled actually had less incidence of cancer or other major disease than people who kept their teeth, but did things in order to keep them. So what happens with a root canal is if this is your tooth, the, the, center is cored out and everything is sucked out from there. So any infection is sucked out there, but it's also taking out the life force, the connection to the, the roots that come out at the bottom. And that gets connected to other life force in us. It's like the meridians. If you look at Chinese medicine, you look at meridians, like, uh, like chiropractic, even you can see that every tooth is connected to different organs in the body. So when, so first of all, when that is all cored out, there's no connection and then it's stuffed. So there's two things happening. One is you're losing that life connection, the life force coming in and out. And number two is this part of the tooth that you think is still your tooth. It's actually dead matter. And so now you have dead matter in our mouth and that's going to ooze out toxins So between these these two reasons, the cutting off of the life force from that root to the rest of your organs and the dead matter sitting in our mouth, whether it's one root canal or some people have multiple, it can cause a lot of residual damage, including major heart issues as well as breast issues. So that is one thing that we often um, educate people who come to our clinic or who are learning about thermography that we also image what we call cranial dental thyroid. Thyroid is another, another piece, but it's connected, but to have that image because it's all connected. And I, I can't tell you how many cases we have where you can see where someone has something going on in this side of their mouth. And then you see the lymphatic connection right down to the breast with some kind of something activity, blood activity going on on that same side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what can one do about it? Well, they can check their teeth. So we let people know, go get this checked. Um, If it's a root canal that's existing, it can be removed. Um, What does that mean? Well, yeah, the tooth actually gets removed. Do you want to replace it? There's different ways to replace the tooth that are kind of Uh, less invasive to more invasive, if you will. Getting an implant can be pretty invasive, but some implants are better than others. Sometimes um, the best choice is to leave it completely out, but maybe have what's called a partial. So it's like a bite plate that has a tooth in that spot um, that can be removed and cleaned and so on. So people have to gauge what they're comfortable with and see what's going to keep reducing their risk 
for added problems. So that was one of the key issues I wanted to tell people about, that that is a hidden connection um, that people should know about. Um, from a prevention perspective, you know, obviously keep your teeth clean, keep your teeth health clean. Even what you eat affects your teeth. Um, this is the biggest orifice in our body and we're constantly putting stuff in and it's going into our whole body. So we should really pay attention to what we're putting in and how we maintain the health of that area. So what specific advice would you have for people in terms of that? What to avoid, what to add? Yeah, so definitely... Um, Obviously, keeping your teeth clean, um, going for regular dental um, cleaning is good. We, but also that has to be done in a careful way because sometimes even the cleaning can kind of push plaque into the gums that go in and down. So again, not to get all scared about all of these things, but um, you know, uh, there's a lot of research on this. People can do their own research and see for themselves. But fluoride is is a known no, no. Again, some dentists and hygienists still um, advocate for fluoride. There's a lot of research that shows that fluoride is is not good. Um, it's actually more toxic than good. Um, again, so that goes into the bloodstream, into lymphatics, etc. So if you can avoid that, I use fluoride flea, free, not flea, fluoride free toothpaste on a regular basis. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, if, if you can get thermography done to have it checked and be on top of it, right? So for example, when I did my dental thermography the first time, there was a hot spot around my upper left molar area. We can't say exactly which tooth it is, but we can say it's in this area. I brought my thermal images to my then holistic dentist who's unfortunately passed away since, but there are others that are still great. And when he looked at the image and he checked my mouth, he saw in a particular in between two teeth, minor gingivitis starting that showed up as heat on the on the thermal image and he was able to clean it and put something inside kind of like almost like a bit of a filling to stop food from getting caught there as easily so it just gives you an example of something minor another woman for example uh who decided to do the cranial dental thyroid exam she called me back afterwards says i'm so glad you told me about this. I went to my dentist, showed him this image. She says, I was just there a month ago. And when I showed him these images and he looked further in this particular area, he found that the crown on my tooth was so hairline fracture cracked. He couldn't see it when he checked it the last time, but now he checked. So he removed it, cleaned it and, and put a new crown. So it's even minor things like that will show up like a minor dental infection that have no symptoms. We very commonly see that when people do their thermal, thermal imaging. So from a, a tip for being preventive, mm -hmm. obviously this is what I do for a living. So I, I'm, I'm very passionate about this. Um, getting thermal imaging to check and be preventive and proactive is a good way to take care of your, of your teeth. Great. And can you tell us more about lymph? I think lymph and the role of lymph in breast health is so is so under you know under under acknowledged and yeah. in in and get movement right what i do is about movement and natural yeah. movement and i think a lot of people don't realize that the lymph doesn't have a pump it doesn't have a mm. pump like the heart and therefore like our movement and our alignment and what we wear is so important. Yes. So let's talk more about lymph. And yes. Breast. Okay. Okay, good. So um, actually, I'm going to put that I was saying that we start from our kind of our head and move our way down. We talked about how we think, talked about our teeth, um, talked a little bit about food, we can talk about that a little bit more. But then we want to talk about what do we put on our body, right? And mm -hmm. so with regards to the lymph, um, underwire bras, not a good idea. Two reasons. One is if they have a metal, up for a wire. A lot of them have plastic now, so that is better, but the metal near the body, not a good idea. So you don't want metals with all the radiation and things that we have around us, like our phones or computers, etc. We don't want to be attracting this kind of radiation towards our body. That's number one. Number two is the pressure that that underwire places on the breasts, on the lymphatics is significant. Um, you know, I went to a bra store that does 
you know, custom bras, et cetera. And I said, I want a wireless. Oh, well, no, you know, they're really not that bad for you. She was trying to convince me. And, you know, thankfully I, I knew better at the time, but, you know, people who are in a certain business, of course, that's what they, that what they do, but it really is, it does apply pressure. And especially if you're wearing it all day, right. From morning till night. So it takes a toll. Um, so I highly recommend not wearing underwire bra. I have one really good underwire bra and I only wear it for a special occasion. If it's going to be a couple of hours or something like that, like my wow. son just got married. I got this really great bra, you know, made me look great just for a few hours. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's that. As far as other aspects of lymphatics, I mean, that is really, that's your, your immune system. Your lymphatics is connected to your immune system. And so, as you said, it's so important to have good flow. So um, sometimes the lymphatics could be, there could be blockages. Okay. Sometimes it could be connected to dental. So that's number one to get that checked. Um, but number two, it could be other reasons unknown. So some things to, that some women do, and I haven't actually done this yet, but I, I'd like to try it, is dry brushing. Have you heard of dry brushing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You go to people, they can do it for you. You can learn how to do it yourself. And so it's, like you said, it doesn't have its own pump. So we have to help get the pumping moving uh, of the flow of the lymphatic mm -hmm. um fluids. So dry brushing is really good. Massage is really good. Um, going into the warm shower and the hot shower and just really just giving yourself like a good massage, very healthy for your lymphatics. Um, and then also on a regular basis, detoxing through sauna, sweat. Okay. Sweat is also going to be really good. It's kind of an indirect support to the lymphatics, but it definitely helps. Um, and then movement, right? Like what you do, right? So it's it's all, you know, going to help you keep that lymphatic um, flow um, healthy. Right. There's, um, I don't know if I can just interject here quickly. There is one thing that we do talk about in the reshape method and a good way to assess whether or not you've got good flow of lymph through this area, right, that is so important for your breast is if you kind of make this kind of like, like turn on your pecs, you should okay. to feel an egg hole. You want an egg yeah. hole there. If you have an egg hole there, then your 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 upper body lymphatics are quite good. If you can't create that egg hole, if it's soft and puffy, it doesn't come in, then there's an issue with your movement and your lymphatics. Well, wow, that's so good to know. I did not know that. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. So so that's um so lymphatics. Again, that's that's like this whole area for women, we gotta just own it, take care of it, and, um, you know, keep ourselves healthy that way. And then food, right? I mean, I think a lot of us know how important it is to eat healthy. And we try, we do our best. And I really do believe, you know, we shouldn't try to overhaul and change everything in our lifestyle all at once. Just one tiny step at a time makes a big difference. Because if you think about it, if you're moving in this direction and you make a tiny change, after a while, you're going in a whole other direction. So if you think about it that way, just one tiny step goes a long way. And so how we eat, you know, so if it's doing a test to see if you have any insensitivities, uh, especially to foods that are more inflammatory, like wheat, gluten, dairy, eggs, um, these are very inflammatory, uh, nightshade, vegetables, and so on. So some people have no problem with those products. Some people do. So to know is a good idea. So that's something to get checked. Um, and then generally speaking to definitely increase as much plant-based food into your diet. I, I'm not an advocate saying you should only eat, you know, plant-based, um, diet. If that is your thing, fantastic. I do mostly eat plant. I'm actually right now on completely plant-based for the next six, six weeks. I made a commitment. Um, but if you can add into your daily repertoire, some more salads, some more steamed vegetables, a little bit more fruit. If you can add that in, that's going to be very good. It's these are good cleansing foods. Um, I, I didn't work all of my way down, but if we go down further, eliminating is really important. And so what you eat that's fibrous and and roughage, that's going to help move things through and out 
Um, you know, that's one of the things in North America that I, I can't quite mm-hmm. wrap my head around that a lot of doctors will say that if you're having a couple of bowel movements a week, you, that's okay. That is not okay. Um, you should be having at least one, if not two a day. So just, you know, again, these are really important things that affect our overall health and affect our breast health. So because it's even, clearing those excess toxins, particularly yes. the excess estrogen, Yes, the system, right? That's right. That's right. So, so these are some of my my tips, um, some of my suggestions, some of these hidden uh, pieces that are not a lot of people know about. Um, and um, I don't know what else I I, I could go on talking for a long. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Let us know. I know there are a few people watching. Let me know if there are any questions that you have for Tali in the chat in the Moving and Reshaping Club. Um, Facebook group um, live stream if you have any questions pop them in the chat Um, otherwise if you're watching on the replay I know a lot of people um, asked for the replay link and I will be sending it out Um, just let us know and Tali can come and answer your questions what I did want to ask did we speak about um, we said you were going to talk about understanding how to properly image your breasts for proactive health did we talk about that yeah, so I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that. So I, I mentioned earlier that um, mammography is a tool that a lot of women know about because their doctor will usually say, oh, if you're 50 or over, you need to start doing mammograms. I have women who come to my clinic and they say, oh, blah, 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 my annual mammogram. And I ask, oh, why are you doing it every year? And they say, oh, because my doctor said so. I'm like, oh, how come? I don't know. So, well, does he, did he or she see that there's some risk level? No. So it's become a standard of practice in North America. That is the standard way that women are supposed to check their breasts, but like a diet, not everybody needs to eat the same. Not everybody's body works the same. So this kind of standard care, thank God we have access to the medical care and system we have not putting it all down, but standardized doesn't mean that it is necessarily good for everybody all the time. And so I said earlier about that it takes uh, at least five, sometimes eight to 10 years for a lesion to be detected by a mammogram. Um, There was a really great study done in and published in 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This study followed 900 women for 25 years and Half the group was using mammograms, half the group was not. Um, At the end of the study, what showed a couple of, a few of the highlights, around the same number of women in the mammogram group, as well as the non-mammogram group had cancer detected. So the mammogram didn't necessarily increase the detection rate. However, in the mammogram group, there were a number of women who were overdiagnosed and had procedures that they didn't actually need, including mastectomies. Um, Another highlight is that the radiation from the mammogram takes approximately 18 months to clear the body. And that's just a mammogram. There's other radiation that we get already from other things, traveling, phone, computers, Wi-Fi, et cetera. So 18 months to clear. So if someone's having a mammogram every year, that's compounding the radiation effect. Um, Another highlight from this study was that if someone has a lesion in their breast already, the compression can potentially cause it to burst and spread. Um, And and so based on these outcomes of the study, they deemed that mammograms can, doesn't mean that they do, but they can contribute to the onset of cancer. Um, And so it provided a kind of a question to the community, if you will, based on that exam or that study, I should say, Switzerland banned mammography. So there is no longer mammography in Switzerland. A number of other European countries have shifted the way they use mammography more to the way, like what I was saying, that it should be used more if it's necessary to escalate and only if it's necessary. Um, And so that's how a lot of countries in Europe now screen uh, women's breasts. They don't use mammography as the main way. They use thermography and ultrasound. And that's what we say is a good combination. Why? Because thermography 
is a physiological test. And I think I mentioned earlier that physiology will always precede anatomy. In other words, there will be a physiological change, a cellular level change before a structural mass starts to grow. And so, so you want to get in as early as possible and in as non-invasive and healthy a way as possible. And that's thermography is one of them. And ultrasound, ultrasound is an anatomical test using sonography, um, the sound waves, very good test, no radiation. Sometimes people don't realize there's no radiation, maybe a little invasive in that it's, you know, kind of pushing and prodding on the breast. But other than that, it's a very, it's a safe, good test. So when you have thermography coupled with ultrasound, plus you're doing your own manual checking or asking your doctor, not all doctors will do a breast exam unless you ask them and sometimes demand from them that they do a proper breast exam. But when you have that combination of checking your breast, that is a great way to be preventive in how you monitor your breast health from a prevention perspective versus only dealing with something when God forbid it's too late. Um, so, so that's the, the kind of flow, if you will, it's using the non-invasive thermography coupled with ultrasound and manual checking and only escalate when necessary. Great. That is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question here about breast cysts. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody saying that they are prone to get breast cysts that come yeah. and go. Um, any, any, any tips on, on those? Are they sure. harmless? What are they indicating that people should be aware of? Sure. No, that's a great question. Okay. So um, this, there could be any number of ways that breasts show up. Sometimes people have cystic breasts, meaning that there are cysts that are just there um, and they don't necessarily go away. Sometimes someone has cysts that come and go. Sometimes it can be connected to the cycle, the menses cycle, right? So before the period comes, the cyst starts to kind of grow. And then as the period is ending or in the middle of the flow to the end, it'll dissipate. There could be different reasons and times for those cysts. Um, generally, uh, so it's they're not all the same situation per se. Um, and some people have what's called fibrocystic. So there's not only cysts, but there's also a fibrousness in between the cysts. You know, uh, doctors will call it dense breasts. That's basically fibrocystic. Um, one of the... Um, foods, if you will, that we lack in our diet is iodine. Um, so there's a, there's a connection, a potential connection. I don't want to be diagnosing or prescribing or anything here, God forbid. And you're going to now start taking iodine and you should do this in a proper way. Um, but iodine is often missing. And, and when women add iodine into their practice, it could be a drop of iodine, Lugol's, L-U-G-O-L apostrophe S, Lugol's like 3% or 5% iodine. Uh, it's a very good brand. It's a good mixture. A drop into a little bit of water and drink it. Um, even putting a drop onto the breast and making like a little painted circle about the size of a loony, a coin. Um, it, it, this is, it'll allow it to go into the skin and into the breast. You can do it on one side, do it on both sides. This is actually a good way to test how your iodine is, because if you put iodine on your skin and it gets soaked up really quickly, it means that your body's really thirsty for iodine. If that stays for, you know, three, four days, meaning like the orangey spot that it leaves on the skin, then you have a, a, a decent level of iodine. So some women will be, it'll be recommended to them to do this, put it on your breast and, um, you know, and keep doing it until you get to a point where that little painted circle is on for a few days. And then, you know, you're at a, a kind of good level. Um, I know for myself, I have a cyst in my left inner breast that comes and goes. It's kind of there all the time, but sometimes it gets a little bigger. Sometimes it gets a little smaller. Mm -hmm. So I, I have paid attention and I know that when I'm not eating very like well, according to the way I know to eat, that cyst will get irritated. It'll actually get bigger and it'll get a little bit more painful. Um, wine, 
very estrogenic and inflammatory. Um, unless, unless you get, you know, organic wines, like certain, there's certain wines that are a little bit less estrogenic. Um, but alcohol in general is not great for our breasts. Unfortunately, women who like to have a little this and that, but again, I say just, you know, reduce it, but I actually tested and I, I found that my, that particular cyst got really painful at a certain point. And when I thought about it, I realized I just came from vacation where we were drinking wine every day. And then, you know, sometimes you come back from vacation, it's hard to stop being on vacation. So, you mm-hmm. know, a little more wine than usual for a little while longer. And I said, oh, I stopped drinking wine. And about a week later, that thing went down and was not painful anymore. So it's, there's a really direct connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, sugar is another one. Okay. So these are the true. <laughs> I know. I know. I like my dark chocolate, you know, but I have to do it and, and, you know, pace myself. Um, so, but sugar is another one. Um, so, so there's iodine, um, as a therapy, and then there's just really monitoring what you eat. Coffee. Coffee is another one. Ladies, I'm sorry. I actually quit coffee. This May is going to be 11 years. I liked, I love coffee. I love the smell. I'm Mm -hmm. like, you know, like my nose follows it. I, Mm. but it doesn't work for my body for different reasons, not just my breasts, also for my joints. I had a major hip pain for years. Um, and through my own discovery, it was kind of accidental, but nothing's really accidental. I discovered it was coffee. The caffeine in the coffee leaches the calcium from the joints. And I personally might be more prone to kind of arthritic nature. Both my parents have forms of arthritis. So for me, coffee doesn't work that way uh, for me, but also for our breasts, it's very acidic coffee, not good for the breast health as well. So those are some things to think about with regards to cysts or fibrocystic. I hope that helps. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question here in the chat. How do I respectively, respectfully tell my doctor I don't want a mammogram without getting into an issue with them? I always feel pressured. I love that question. So you're not alone, whoever just asked that. So um, it's um, so first of all, you want to acknowledge and be thankful for your doctor. Okay, if you want to keep that relationship with your doctor, if you're not looking to change doctors, um, then you want to really, as you said, respect. So you can say, exactly, listen, I, I want you to know, I've been with you for this many years, and I haven't left on purpose. So I, I really like our relationship, and I'm happy. And I am um, just have I have concerns about the negative impact of mammograms. Um, I've done research, or you should do the research if you haven't. Um, but I am not comfortable using this as a method of monitoring my breast health. Um, I've heard about thermography. I've heard about ultrasound being non-invasive or non-radiation, and thermography being non-invasive and safe. And I'd like to use these other methods. Can we work together? You know, I, you know, I, I, I want to appreciate what you contribute to me as my doctor. I also want you to please listen to me as your patient. This is what I'm asking. If we can work together and have a a kind of a happy medium, sometimes um, a doctor will just say, okay, fine, go do that thermography thing or, you know, um, and sometimes, sometimes they'll say nasty things about it when they really don't know anything about it. Or sometimes they just don't know. And they say, you know what? I don't know. If you want to do it, go ahead. Um, but I am finding that more and more doctors, uh, medical, meaning medical family doctors are becoming aware of thermography again, because of these studies and because of women speaking up. So you should feel empowered by that and know that your voice really does matter and it really does make a difference. So that's how I would talk to them. Um, If it's a really bad situation, you know, I have had people tell me that their doctor will say, if you don't do mammogram, I can't be your doctor. Then you need to make a decision. And I, I say, get a doctor that has either an ideal state, the ideal situation is that you have a common mindset with your doctor, but at the very least, maybe you don't think exactly the same, but there's a willingness by your doctor to work with you and to come to some common ground. 
Um, but sometimes people do have to leave their doctor and go find someone that they can work with. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for coming to talk to us about this really, really important topic. Maybe you can just let everyone know, like, how widely available is um, thermography in North America, where, where most of our viewers are watching? And you also mentioned about it was Switzerland, right? Not doing yeah. mammograms anymore. Have, right. they, have they switched to thermography? So th from what I understand, thermography and ultrasound. Um, right. MRI is another, I mean, that is that's just another modality that some people are are using as well. Um, and that's pretty much it though. Yeah. Thermography and ultrasound. Um, in terms of how readily available it is, I can tell you um, thermography clinic. If you go to thermographyclinic.com, that's our website. Um, if you go near the top, right, there's a link that says locations and there's a drop down menu and you can see different locations that, that are around Canada and locations around the United States. Um, and so that's, that's one place where you can look. Um, these are clinics that have been trained by us. We have a, a standard, um, Dr. Mostavoy, Alexander Mostavoy, he's the one who pioneered this technology in Canada uh, about 25 years ago. He's a board certified clinical thermologist. So he's trained to train others um, and has been doing so for years. So people who are in that network that are listed on our website have been trained and are following the proper methods of um, performing thermography exams um, and all the exams that they receive to give the, the reports come from our uh, from our central locations that they're getting them from us. Um, that's I can speak to in terms of knowing that, you know, we keep a certain standard. It's it's using cold water challenge. I didn't get into this, but part of the process when being imaged is um, the hands go into cold water, 10 degrees for 60 seconds. And this is a very important part of the test to look at how the breasts are functioning in a static state and then a dynamic or functional state. By putting the hands in the cold water, it causes vasoconstriction um, and creates a shock, so to speak. And we wanna see how the vascular activity responds to that. Um, so it's really important that that's part of the breast exam and not a lot of, not all places do that. So it's important to know what method do they use and who is analyzing the results and providing the report. Um, and what, what does the report look like? And do they give you a phone call after and walk you through it? Some places just email you a report and you don't know how to read the thing. And then you have to pay extra money to get a consultation or things like that. So I can tell you that from a clinic in our network, you get the, the, the highest standard of methodology and the reports are highly um, regarded and people get a consultation with their exam. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for coming to share all this information with us today. Really, really enlightening. And I love how there's actually so much overlap with with the reshape method we also there's a whole um module in the reshape method called dress for success and Ooh. a big part of that is about getting proper you know proper bras or not as mm. as the case may be i mean i haven't worn a bra for years and years and years it's also about getting the proper strength and your ligaments and your muscles that you're not really relying on that bra so much for support yes. there is a certain amount of movement that is required in in the breast tissue like the breasts on weren't designed to just stay you know locked yes. and loaded the whole time right so true yeah so, yeah so that is also something that we go into in in the reshape method so i love that there is overlap and i'm thinking i need to be doing um a breast movement workshop for everyone. I think that will be coming up soon. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tali, for coming to speak to us. I think we really do not give the boobs the attention and um, deference that they deserve. Um, so thank you so much for coming well, to chat with us and please ask your questions in the chat and um, will you be able to come and answer some questions in the chat? Uh, like you mean offline right now or staying here? Yeah, right yeah, now? yeah. For people, because a lot of people will be watching the replay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they can tag you on that. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thank you for coming to talk to us, Sally. Great.